everybody. I see some wonderful friends here with us. Um, I just want to welcome everybody to our Cash for College Town Hall. I'm Assemblymember Eloise Reyes, uh, the Majority Leader here for the California State Assembly, but more importantly, I'm the Assemblymember representing the 47th Assembly District, which encompasses the communities of Fontana, Colton, Grand Terrace, Rialto, San Bernardino, and the unincorporated communities of Bloomington and Muscoy. Uh, with us today is a, a wonderful representative. This is Edwin Tikukwa uh, the, from the Cash for College Outreach. He is a coordinator for the California Student Aid Commission. Welcome, Edwin. Thank you so much for being here with us. I also want to, and we're going to hear from Edwin shortly. I also want to thank all of you for joining us today for this important and necessary teleconference discussing cash, cash for college, including a discussion on FAFSA, the DREAM Act, and scholarships. I think it's vital that our students and families have all the information necessary when applying for college. We need to ensure that all students have equitable and equal access and the opportunities for higher education. I'm excited to be a part of this discussion because I know the importance of education. I know also what it's like to depend on financial aid and scholarships to go to school. I'm a proud graduate of California schools and colleges, and I'm also proud that I was also a, an educator before I became an assembly member. Although I am an attorney by trade, an attorney for 30 years. But I remember firsthand how important it was for my students when I was teaching at Cal Poly Pomona, how important it was for them to have access to financial aid and the student support resources that helped them on their path to and through college. And part of seeking access to financial aid is filling out the necessary forms and you have to fill them out on time. Uh, in 2018, I'm proud to share that Governor Brown signed my bill AB 2015, making sure that all high schools provide information to students on completing the financial aid applications. I'm also proud of that new law, which set aside or set a statewide baseline for financial aid information. Our advocacy should not stop there and it's not stopping there. I am already ready to take the next step by requiring financial aid completion as part of a student's high school experience. And that's why this year I've authored AB 469, which will make completion of FAFSA a high school graduation requirement with the opportunity to opt out, but making it a requirement. This requirement is also reflected in Governor Newsom's budget priorities. And I look forward to working with him to make this a reality so that no student misses out on going to college. Historically here in Sacramento, policymakers have debated and discussed the nuances of proposed policy proposals. And, there, and without a doubt, and you all have read about it, sometimes there's disagreement, but I can tell you that there's one thing that we can all agree on, and that is the importance of an education and also the fact that California is expensive. I love our state and I want to make sure that more of our students in California can go to college in our great state. We all know the value of this higher education and also the doors that it can open for our young people and the doors that it has opened for many of us who are here on this call today, particularly for our communities of color. Education is the pathway to not only improving oneself, but a pathway to uplift an entire community. Higher education should always be an opportunity and not a burden. Some may say we shouldn't add more requirements to what it already takes to graduate here in California. But we know this proposal is more than a benefit, more of a benefit than it is a barrier. Here in the Inland Empire, the Val Verde Unified School District made this change a couple of years ago and they've had enormous success. They made this systematic change for students because they recognize that their students deserve every opportunity and every support that's available to make sure their college dreams become a reality. And they recognize that financial aid was key. Nationwide, there are three states that require completion of the financial aid application before somebody can graduate from high school. 
They include Louisiana, Texas, and Illinois. In the first year of implementation, Louisiana's FAFSA completion rates went from 26% to 77%, making them the state with the highest FAFSA completion rate in the nation. In addition, Louisiana saw 6% increase in higher education enrollment after the requirement was put in place. Our goal is to make it easier for California students to go to college. Bel Verde Unified has done that. Louisiana and others have done that. And the research is clear. California must do it. By providing students and families assistance with completing and submitting a FAFSA, you significantly increase the chances of that student enrolling into college. And this is especially true for low-income students. I encourage you all to also focus on a regional Inland Empire approach to increasing FAFSA access, just as the Val Verde Unified School District did several years ago. Together, we can make a change in California and in our own communities. Now, before we get started, I do wanna um, set some expectations for this call. I'm going to introduce our special guest um, and I'm going to have him speak. And we have some questions that have already been uh, submitted to us. We've collected the questions over the past several days from community re that, that are specifically regarding financial aid. Uh, we've received lots of excellent questions. We're gonna to try to get through as many of these as we possibly can. And uh, if we don't get to your question, or if you think of a question wh while we're going through this, please write it down and you can email it to Esmeralda Vasquez from my office. Um, she will, uh, and be sure to include your contact information so that we can get the information to you. Now Esmeralda also asked that in the chat box that you put down your name and who, who you're representing here today, or if you're a student, that you are a student. We wanna gather whatever questions we don't get to. Um, but let's begin. Um, Edwin, again, welcome. I, I want you, before you, you tell us about your role, tell us a little bit about yourself and then tell us about your role in the California Student Aid Commission. Um, tell us exactly what this role is uh, with the student, California Student Aid Commission. Awesome. Um, thank you so much, Assembly Member. I appreciate that awesome introduction. And I appreciate you giving me the time to speak today about a very important issue. So I'm currently the Cash for College Analyst, the Outreach Coordinator for the Cash for College Program. Um, I run the program. I coordinate workshops across the state of California with the help of high school counselors, community college advisors, as well as financial aid advisors, which pretty much helps students and families fill out these applications. That's my job. Uh, my a quick backstory, I'm actually a first generation immigrant, moved to the United States at the age of 14. Uh, with my mother. And yeah, I definitely did not see a way out except education. And so for me, this is a very personal issue. I attended the University of California, Santa Barbara, where I actually was invested very much in higher education policies and activities. And now I'm here in Sacramento. So this is very personal. I'm a beneficiary of the Cal Grant. I'm a beneficiary of state aid, federal aid. And so I know how serious this topic is for a lot of families. And I take that seriously. And this is my way, hopefully, of giving back so that other people can experience the same opportunities that I've been privileged to experience. Wonderful. All right, let's get to our first question. Here's our first question. Um, are there any scholarship resources or assistance for non And before, before I, I ask the first question, I do want to recognize that another one of our partners in putting this together was LEAD from Cal State San Bernardino, and that's Dr. Enrique Murillo, who has been a champion for education uh, for our students for, for years and years. So Enrique, I do want to thank you for being one of our partners. I also want to recognize um, Frank Reyes, trustee for the San Bernardino Community College District, my husband also, but more importantly, he is a trustee and Angel Rodriguez from the college district as well. I also see that we have um, Jesus Olguin, who is a school board member in Riverside where we have Valverde and has done a great job. Danny Morales, 
Thank you so much for being with us, Tim Prince. There are so many more of you and I, I don't want to take too much more time because I want to hear uh, Jose Torres, who is the um, chancellor for the San Bernardino Community College and District is with us as well. Thank you all for being with us and maybe we'll recognize a few others. But Edwin, here's our first question. Um, are there any scholarship resources or assistance Assistance for non-traditional students that are not familiar or don't have access to a computer or or internet service. Awesome. Um, that's a yeah. That's a that's a great question. So there are definitely scholarship resources. Um, so and it depends on the program. So first of all, the main programs I really want to talk about today are the California Grant, the Cal Grant, and then you have the Pal Grant, which is a federal grant. Um, so for for uh, FAFSA filers, if you're filling out the FAFSA, you would be potentially be able to qualify for the Cal Grant and the Pell Grant. If you're filling out um, the CADA for the California GMAC application, that's for undocumented students, you'd be able to qualify for state aid, which would be the California grants. So for example, the California grant, one of the things non-traditional students can access is a, uh, let's say if they have children, if they have dependent children, they can access an additional $6,000 reward, four to $6,000 reward to help them with it, to help them have new children on top of the other potential grant aid they may get. So there's different scholarships like that. Um, in terms of outside of the, of the federal government and the state government, you also do have websites such as FastWeb and a bunch of other websites that pretty much have scholarships for random things. We always, you, you'll be surprised what kind of scholarships are out there. Like for some people it's how tall you are, different, different random things. So we always recommend people look out there. There's billions of dollars that is constantly left on the table because students um, don't look out. And then if you have an issue with the computer, these applications, the FAFSA and the CADA, they can be done in paper. So that's just another thing to note. Uh, also recommend talking to the college that you're going to. This is a very um, disregarded method of, this is a very, um, uh, students for some reason don't focus on this particular method. Mm. If you are in a specific department in your college, that department tends to offer scholarships to students. So if you are going to college, always check in with the department, always check in there. And then, yeah, just those are the basic tips I would recommend. I would say look on scholarship websites such as FastWeb, uh, which can help you figure out scholarships. Obviously, if you see a scholarship that's asking for very, very personal information, you're not sure, we always recommend be careful because some of those scholarship websites, uh, people will post fake scholarships and then take you to a third party site. So you always just want to be very careful what information you're putting there. But these are different opportunities. And then you can also, once again, print out a version of the FAFSA or the California GMAC application and mail it in rather than having to fill it out on a computer. So those are kind of just some general ideas there. And I would imagine that uh, if you don't have access to a computer, there, the library or the, the school counselor or going to a community college and asking for assistance there, uh, finding or go to your state assemblywoman's office and tell them that you need help and get some assistance. I, I, I think you're right. And, and something that you mentioned about um, there's millions of dollars left on the table because there are specific requirements for some scholarships. It could be that they're looking for a first generation engineering student or a first generation from a particular country uh, that's going to be studying nursing. Uh, there are some specifics in, in requirements in some of these. And I always found it um, very interesting when I was applying for, for scholarships, I, I, I looked through everything to see what they needed and see where I could fit in there. So thank you for reminding us of that. Um, one of the questions that is asked of me is, uh, uh, do I sponsor any local scholarships? Uh, there are lots of uh, scholarships in addition to, to the ones I'm going to tell you about, but. I am uh, here in Sacramento, I'm a member of the, the California Legislative Women's Caucus. And the Women's Caucus offers scholarships. I'm also a member of the Latino Caucus and the Latino Caucus has, uh, uh, offers scholarships, they're $5,000 scholarships. So it's, it's uh, quite an amount, quite frankly, and we select people from the Inland Empire, from my district specifically. Um, so do look out for those. Um, and just check in with my office. They'll tell you when, when those are available. Um, here's another question, uh, Edwin. What resources did you utilize uh, to aid you in, to, be, to be successful? 
got it. So perfect. Uh, that's a great question. So the resources I used, so like you mentioned, assembly member, one of the things is high school counselors, right? Going to your counselor. I had a high school counselor who I was saying, I don't know if I can pay for college. And then she just said, oh, but I have this scholarship that I think you should apply for. So I was like, oh, I didn't even think about that. And so going to high school counselors and asking around, uh, that's a really big, great deal. If you're a part of any organization, whether it be a church, uh, whether it be a club, whether it be whatever things you are part of, going and checking out those because they might have uh, different scholarship opportunities. Uh, another thing which I definitely used, I attended the Cash for College workshop. And it's actually ironic that I attended this workshop and I'm the one running the program, which is <laughs> ironic, so it's full circle. But the way these Cash for College workshops were happening when we were in person was that we would you would go there and then they would sit you and walk you through the different financial aid applications. So the FAFSA and the California Dream Act application. And, and also I know I use FAFSA a lot, so for those of you who don't know, free application for federal student aid and then the California Dream Act application. So FAFSA is for- uh, What's the deadline? Let, let, let's, let's begin there. What's the deadline for FAFSA? So there's a March 2nd deadline. Now, I wanna be very clear about the March 2nd deadline. The March 2nd deadline is a state deadline. And the reason why it's important is if you're filling out the FAFSA or the California Dream Act application, and you are trying to go to a four-year university or transferring to a four-year university, there is a California grant that has a March 2nd deadline. And the difference between applying before March 2nd is if you apply before March 2nd or right before March 2nd, and you meet all the other requirements, you will get this grant as an entitlement. If you apply after March 2nd, you'll be put in a competitive pool where you have a one in eight chance of getting this grant. So just because you apply on a different date, that can completely change the outcome. And why is this grant so important? Because at uh, public universities, it can cover tuition. At private universities, it's about $9,000. So this grant really, a year, this grant really goes a long way. So for me, I didn't know that up until I attended the Cash for College workshop and I said, oh, I need to get this application in as soon as possible, the moment I learned that. So that was extremely helpful. And then the main thing I would say is, you know, once you've filled up the application, definitely call your financial aid office. Um, each financial aid office is different. And I know mo many students who apply to different schools. That's why we recommend that when you put out that application, you've signed, you've completed it, your parents have signed and completed it if they need to, then call the financial aid office. If you have a special circumstance, which we know a lot of people have due to COVID, then they can help you walk you through that. So those are the different resources I used. And I would just always recommend students to continuously bug the financial aid office. It's their job. It's their job once you're in college and use all those resources. And that, that was my journey. That was what helped me. And if, if our students don't get the help they, they need from the, their counselors, where else can they call? Uh, yeah, and we see that quite often. So they can call us at the California Student Aid Commission. We pretty much designed the California GMAT application and to mirror the FAFSA. So we can help with both applications. Uh, there's also the federal um, government's hotline. So the federal, the federal government has a hotline, the Department of Education has a hotline where you can call and you can ask. And that will be specifically for FAFSA questions. Whereas the California Student Aid Commission, we can help you out with FAFSA as well as CADA questions, which is our shorthand for California Dream Act application. So other resources, your assembly member too, and they can direct you to us. And yeah, there's, there's a myriad of resources to call. What is the, um, what's the website? So that would be csac.ca.gov, um, csac.ca.gov. If you just type in California Student Aid Commission in your search engine, we will show up, we will be right there. Uh, that is where you can find us. That is for the state, uh, that's CSAC. Now, if you're looking for the FAFSA and you are more interested in those federal resources, the FAFSA application, then you just want to go directly to the FAFSA and you're like, you know what, I don't need CSAC, I can figure this out with FAFSA, then mystudentaid.gov, mystudentaid.gov. Well, and that's become a one-stop shop for everything now. I, I'm glad that the government finally gets to the one-stop shops because that's not the way it used to be for those of us who applied for financial aid many years ago. All right, um, here's another question. Uh, does Cash for College host any webinars that community members can enroll in? I am so glad you asked that. It is funny you asked that because right now, actually, at the moment I hop on this, up this call, I'm going to be hosting a workshop uh, for another community. So we do host workshops. I think this year so far, we're at about 800. Uh, and the way they work is 
you will have workshops that are organized by local communities. Um, so local organizations, local community based organizations, some organized by high school counselors. These are open to everybody and they're accessible on our website. So you can go and see, OK, I'm looking for these particular workshops in this region. You can go there and attend there. The other thing, um, because of how unprecedented everything is this year, we had the Senate Commission. We said, OK, typically we train people to host workshops. This year, we're going to be leading the charge. And so we have what are called statewide cash for college webinars. And the advantage about these ones in a COVID environment versus the, um, the other ones that are going on is that we also have a, a hotline. So instead of just having a presentation where we walk you through both applications, FAFSA and CADA, we have Q&A where you can ask questions while the presentation is going and people will answer your question live. And then we also have a hotline that you can call in and ask a very personal question and they will stay with you for 10 minutes. And so these webinars are about three hours long, no, two and a half hours. We actually have one going on. This will be our final one for February before March 2nd on February 25. And I can send uh, uh, some of the assembly members office all that information if y'all are interested in registering. Great presentation. We'll walk you through everything. We'll make sure that you leave because our goal is to make sure that you leave the workshop with your application completed. That's wonderful. And in the end, that's what we want. Uh, we want to, it, 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 when you've already gone through these applications, it just seems so simple, but they're not. When you're putting down information regarding earnings and, and personal information, um, and your parents sometimes don't want to provide that information. What are you asking me how much I earn? And, um, it's really important to help the students not only begin the, the application process, but get to the end and submit it so that they can get the, the cash that they need for college. And I want to repeat that the deadline is coming up. It's really important for our students that they get it before March 2nd or by March 2nd. Um, otherwise, they're going to be competing with so many and just by missing it by one day. But if you miss it by one day, it doesn't matter. Get it in. Um, you missed it this year. Next year, well, you're not going to miss it. But be sure that you, that, that you tell the students to apply on time. Now, here's another question from the community. Has COVID-19 affected FAFSA or scholarship aid? It has not affected the aid. Um, students can still get the aid that they need. What's been affected actually is the applications. Um, that's what we've seen because people have been more nervous to go to college, specifically first time high school seniors. Whereas graduate students, for some reason, graduate students are extremely excited and they're applying way higher than they've ever applied before. But we are really concerned with some of the data that we're seeing. Uh, for first time high school seniors, the applications are down 11% for FAFSA applicants. For California Dream Act applications, um, the applications are down 45% for first time high school seniors. So these are really troubling numbers. And it's scary because in a normal year like 2018, $2.6 billion in just federal money was left on the table and 300 million in California by students not applying. So you can imagine how much money is going to be left on the table this year. So short answer, the aid has not changed. Um, what's changed is the application. Now some universities might have changed the application requirements for like UC removing the SAT and stuff like that. That you'd have to go check with the universities, but in terms of aid, it, it's still the same aid packages. And the bottom line is that we're leaving money on the table. Exactly. It's, it's true. The federal money, the state money, scholarships, money is left on the table. Um, it's just for our students, making sure that they have access so that they know where, where to look for the money. All right. So here's an, another community question. It says, will students in 2021 receive less aid due to the move to distance learning and the reduced cost? Got you. So... Yeah, it, it depends. It's a very much it depends question because part of the way we calculate the way the calculation is made is it, it includes your housing plan. So if you were to say that um, you are going to be living off campus, I'm going to be living pretty much at home, that would decrease your total cost of attendance. And so the way the calculation works is total cost of attendance minus um, expected family contribution, which is your income, your assets, your household size, all those different things. And that is how we calculate student financial need. So if your total cost of attendance goes down, that means um, your student financial need would go down. Whereas if you still say, I'm gonna be living on campus, 
and you are going to be living on campus and you do have to pay rent then, then your total cost of attendance would be staying the same. And in that case, you wouldn't see much of a difference based uh, between the current COVID situation and pre-COVID financial aid packages. I will tell you that I, I do sit on the budget subcommittee too on student uh, finance or, or school finance. And um, that's been one of the topics um, that was proposed that through, through the Cal grants that it not be reduced because moving back home is temporary and it's required because of the pandemic. So these are things that are being looked at. The other big area is the fact that community college students uh, for, for many of the grants, it, they don't look at the fact that they do have to pay for rent and yet that's not considered. And we have 2.1 million community college um, students and uh, that's an absolute injustice. And believe me, we're working on it. We're working on it. Um, all right, next question. Um, is there any supplemental aid that DREAMer recipients can apply for and, and uh, get? So yes, 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 yes. And um, this, is, this is one of the things where my, my, I'm, I'm really fighting to, to really get this out there is California Dream Act, California Dream Act. You will all hear me say this because when we think of financial aid, we do typically think of FAFSA. It didn't make sense. Um, overwhelmingly, most students would be filling out the FAFSA. Uh, but for California Dream Act application, that is the application that our undocumented community would fill out. Now, I want to make it very clear because this is a common misconception. Because it is named California Dream Act, people assume it's only for people with DACA. It's not. You, it's it, DACA. You can apply for it with or without DACA. Uh, DACA is a federal work program. It has nothing to do with financial aid. So I just want to make that very clear. But if you are undocumented, please apply for the California GMAC application. There's, once again, you can get access to the Cal Grant, get access to other types of financial aid. It's really great access to institutional aid. So we definitely recommend that you apply. Wonderful. And I see Brenda Dowdy is with us also. She's the project manager for homeless education. I'm very proud that she's joining us. And before I go th through the questions that were asked before uh, today, I, I see that there are a, a few other um, questions. Um, there was one about, um, I'm trying to get to it, for foster youth um, who, uh, who um, opted out and is living on their own, are there specific scholarships for our foster youth? Yes, so there's, there's a couple of things. Yeah, there's, yeah, there's a couple of things there. So first of all, we have what is called the Chafee Grant. And I believe the, the requirements for the Chafee Grant is if you were in foster youth for a day between the age of 16 and 18, then you would qualify for the Chafee Grant and you should apply just for a day between the ages of 16 and 18. And why that is really nice is because the Chafee Grant, on top of the potential state and federal aid that a student can get, um, the Chafee Grant can add up to $5,000 a year. And so it would not take, it's, it's beautiful in that unlike other forms of aid, it wouldn't take away from the rest of your package. It would be added on top. So that's $5,000 a year. And that can be found once again on our website. Um, students, and you only have to apply for it once. Once you apply for it once, if you're a foster care um, or you, if, you were, if you qualify for it, you apply for it once and then you can get that $5,000 a year um, throughout the course of your education. That's wonderful. And I, I do see that Daisy Esparza from the San Bernardino County Superintendent of Schools is with us. She is in charge of the homeless and foster youth services. Um, and we have some mothers here, of, of some students that are graduating. Um, somebody is asking, how do we collect grants? And that's a lot of what we're talking about here. Uh, and the big deal is to apply and, and to, to search out. Um, one of the questions I had read and I can't find it now about a book on scholarships. Tell us about that. Yeah, so in terms of scholarships, um, I believe on our website also, we list a bunch, a, a bunch of different websites where students can go and check out for scholarships. So that's, pretty much how yeah that, that is how i'd recommend it just go on a website we obviously endorse these websites but we we always say trade with caution because once it starts taking you to multiple different sites when you click on it then you should be careful so that's just what we recommend however 
Uh, yeah, if you go on a website, we do just have pages where we just list out different websites that have scholarships. That's wonderful. I, I see that Kelsey San Bernardino also is with us. Veronica Medina, financial aid wellness coordinator. Thanks for being with us. And it, one of the things, Edwin, is that when you, for the students and for the parents, you really have to invest some time in this. Um, the, the FAFSA Dream Act, some of those applications, you get to the, 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 you start filling it out, you get to the end and you submit it. But looking for scholarships and other opportunities, you really have to invest some time in this and find those that, 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 that where you're a match for it. I, I will tell you when I was in law school, the, the Beverly Hills Bar Association offered a scholarship and to minority students. So my friend and I applied, we went in, we're interviewed and we each got a thousand dollars. That, that was, it, it was the easiest thing to do, but somebody from the financial aid office told us about it. And that's what helped us to, um, to, to do that. Um, here's another question. Um, th here, th this is the one that I had s seen early. Do you have the name of the current scholarship and grant book for this year? I'm not sure what the question is other than what you have answered. And we'll see if there's something more that we can be answering uh, for, for that particular person. So um, specifically with, with our students, are there certain, is there certain uh, funding that is not available to our undocumented students? Yes. Um, so what we know is this, because um, they are undocumented students, they, first of all, documented students should not be filling out the FAFSA. Um, you should not be filling out the FAFSA. Um, every student needs to fill out, if you're interested in college, you should fill out one application. And if you're undocumented, then that application would be the California Dream Act application. So that's the first thing. Now, because it is a state application, you'd only qualify for state aid. And you wouldn't be able to access the federal money because of federal regulations that don't allow that federal money to go to undocumented students. So that's why we recommend, once again, we just want to be clear. Uh, I know that a lot of DACA recipients get really confused because they have a DACA social security number. So they think, oh, maybe I should apply for the FAFSA. No, 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 no. you should still apply for the California GMAT application. And yeah, just fill out that application and it only allows you to access state aid, not federal aid, unfortunately. And that is true for so much of, uh, for any aid here in California. Uh, we recently had the California Earned Income Tax Credit. Um, we just added those who file with I-10s, but they will never be able to qualify for the Earned Income Tax Credit from, from the federal government, but from the state that is available to, to those who file with I-10s. Now, uh, my dear friend, Maricela Ferguson, uh, noted on here that it's not just parents who are helping their children. She says there are lots of grandparents supporting high school grandchildren, and they also need help in filling this out. I'm grateful to Maricela, who works with a lot of our seniors and makes sure that they get the resources that, that they do need. Um, it's, if a student is filling out a form and they're living with a grandparent, uh, whose information would they provide? Is it the parents or the grandparents? That is a great, great question. That is a common question we get. So um, as with everything, it's always technical. And so this is how <laughs> this is how it works. So the students should always be putting in their biological parents' information. That's who they should be putting in. Even if their biological parent is in a different country, if their biological parent is, yeah, they should always be putting in that information. They should only put in an aunt, an uncle, a grandparent, um, a legal guardian, if that individual has legally adopted them. And not by a lawyer, but has actually gone before a judge and that whole process has been established that this student has been legally adopted by this particular individual. So that's the only time you should be putting in a parent, a grandparent, no, not, a, not a, parent, a grandparent, an uncle, an aunt, a brother, a sister, legal guardians information on the application. With that being said, if you, for some reason, can, the student does not have access to their parent, um, so they can't reach their parent, they are having issues with their parent, there are a set of questions where they could indicate that, and that would potentially allow them to be put into what is called an independent status, 
where they would not need parent information to submit and complete the application. But that typically needs to be verified with a particular college. Now, if their parent is alive and they still are having issues contacting their parent and they answer those dependency questions and the application says you need your parent's application, but they're saying, hey, even though I have my parent, I still can't access them, then they should go to their financial aid office and talk to that financial aid office. And that financial aid office has the power to make what is called a professional judgment to say, okay, you know what? There's clearly an issue why you cannot contact your parents, your biological parents. So I'm going to make you an independent student so that you don't need the information to complete the application. Regardless, the student should still submit. In whatever situation, whatever the situation the student should still try and get it, especially if they're transferring to a four-year, applying to a four-year before March 2nd. So. No, that's that's the short answer on that. And an important answer, quite frankly, um, and I realize that maybe we need to change the laws um, so that the legal guardian would also qualify. But the law as it is now, it is only the the adoptive parents or the biological parents. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I know we have to make some changes to the law um, regarding. Um, injuries to students and we had to include uh, legal guardians because it was only adoptive parents who could represent them. So as with everything, if there, if there is a will, there is a way, right? Sometimes it takes a little extra courage. Uh, I see that Maria is with us from Sa uh, San Bernardino Valley College from the finance office. Thank you. And she says that if any students need help from uh, San Bernardino Community College District, she's put her email address on there as well. Um, again, um, talking about uh, undocumented students, uh, somebody has put, uh, says, should future undocumented graduate students apply for the DREAM Act? On that one, I believe so, but I will check. I'll check back to you and I'll get back to you on that one. I believe so. There's, yeah, I believe they should do the work qualify for the DREAM loan, but I will check and just make sure. And I'll get back to you all on that one. Wonderful. Um, another question says, how many times can you apply for a Cal Grant? So the way Cal Grant works is um, you, it can be used, I believe it has a 400% cap. Um, and I'll, I'm not going to get too technical, but the simplified way would be to say you can apply for it about four times. And then, so that's the simplified way of putting it. And then you can use some of your portions over summer. Um, oh yeah, you can use that. But that is a simplified way of saying it. So you can use it for about four years typically. And yeah, I, I, will, I will say that without getting too technical into the numbers, but yeah, it's about four times. You need to submit your application every single year um, while you're in college on time. And remember that um, with every rule, sometimes there is an exception. So rather than giving up and saying, okay, that was my fourth year, I can't do anything ask more questions because the, a lot of the answers will apply to that person who's applying the first year and the second year, they haven't gone to the fourth year, but if you're already at the fourth year and you want to know what else and what exceptions there are, please follow up with someone depending on wh where you are, what, what, what college you're at or, or what have you. Do ask more questions and, and never give up and look for other doors. If one door closes and you know, they say, find the window. Uh, here's uh, from Brenda Dowdy. She says, we have many youth that are unaccompanied, not in the physical custody of parents or guardian, and they do not need their parents' income information. Edwin, that's part of what you talked about, that there are, uh, again, the exceptions and it would still go through. And Brenda, thank you for sharing that. Because obviously having Brenda know that means that she, when she's helping those students, she is knowledgeable and is someone that can provide good information to the students. So thank you so much for that. Uh, somebody asked, what was the Latino scholarship that was mentioned? That's the, the, the California Legislative uh, Latino Caucus uh, Scholarship. And I, um, if you will follow up with my office, we normally advertise it um, I unfortunately, I don't remember when it is um, that we give the scholarship out. And I, should, I know Maha or Esmeralda or Daisy will put it in the chat box, but we advertise the fact that 
we're accepting applications. We, in California, it, it, this is offered throughout California. And this, I think there were 80 scholarships of $5,000 $5, each. We had 1,800 applicants. So it's very difficult, it's very competitive, uh, but if you are selected, it's a wonderful scholarship. Uh, the same thing with the Women's Caucus, we advertise it, uh, we send out information to the counselors, but do follow up with my office regarding that. Um, here's another question. Are there grants uh, restricted per family or is it per student? Uh, uh, this, this mother has two senior boys who are graduating in 2021. Yeah, so the grants are per student. They're not restricted per family. The the way the and actually the application will ask whether how many how many children are in college. So it will factor that in to the calculation. It will factor that into the household calculation, and it will use all that information to determine whether um, what the student's financial need is. And based off the student's financial need, that's what will determine whether the student gets a grant from the state and for the federal government or. Not. So that's pretty much how the calculation works. So it's not, hey, we gave it to this family, so we can't give another one to this family. That's not how it works. It's definitely based on what is the need of this particular individual student. So it is each student, each student. That, that's, that's um, as you say, Edwin, that's the important part. Each one is applying individually and each one will be evaluated individually. Very good. Um, but here's another question. Uh, with someone with a high school diploma and an AA degree, will the financial aid benefits, um, it, will student aid um, through financial aid be decreased because they now have an AA degree? So no, um, if you're going to your, if you go to the four-year uh, institution, you actually could potentially qualify for what is called a transfer entitlement, which would be the Cal grant. However, this is where I remember everybody, the March 2nd deadline is so critical. Um, so if you're planning on going to a four-year university, you could qualify for a transfer entitlement. Um, you could qualify for, I, I'm not sure what your status is, but if you are a FAFSA file, you can qualify for federal aid. If you are a K to file, you'd qualify mainly for state aid, only for state aid. So no, it does not decrease um, if, you are, if you have an A and a high school diploma and are going to a fourth year. Again, it's based on the need and it's based on how much of it you're, you are expected to pay or your parents are expected to pay. Uh, here's another question. Um, uh, it says, I am currently a high school senior. I wanted to know if there's a, a Cal grant that covers the cost of books. And if so, what should I do? Got it. So we have, uh, to, without getting too complicated, there's three different Cal grant programs that currently exist. There's Cal grant A, Cal grant B, Cal grant C. So if you fall in the income range for Cal Grant B, then on top, uh, then there is an access award, which is meant for tuition and books, which could be also used at a community college. So that is that would be for Cal Grant B. Uh, with Cal Grant A, Cal Grant A would only just cover tuition and um, Cal Grant C for vocational training, uh, specifically at a community college or technical trade school. So yeah, Cal Grant B would be the specific Cal Grant, if you fall within those income ranges, that would give you an access award for textbooks. Now, um, something that, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention this, um, California, the California legislature and the governor did sign the, the California Promise program that provides for free community college for the first two years for first time, um, uh, first time for recent graduates. So if you're a high school student and you apply to a community college, your first two years will be free. Now I will tell you, and I'm very proud of San Bernardino Community College District and that San Bernardino Valley College and Crafton Hills College, they do provide not only the, the free tuition, but books. Um, they also have a stipend. Um, they also provide the computer. I mean, they, they, they went all out in helping the, our first time students. So do, do ask um, how long that program is going to, to, to continue. Um, now, if it already ended, I know I'm gonna hear about this later today, um, but uh, th this was something that the, the district decided to do on their own. They put in $10 million to help our first time uh, 
Valley College and Cracklin Hills College students uh, received this financial aid. Um, um, and then Esmeralda has noted on there. Now, I, I do want to ask a question. You've already said it a few times, and I want you to repeat it because I want everybody to hear it. When is the deadline for the FAFSA application? It is March 2nd. You want to make sure you get that in there by March 2nd. Please, please, please make sure you get that in there by March 2nd. You do not want to be competing for a competitive Cal grant. I once saw a statistic that said you have a higher chance of winning in Vegas in some cases than competing for a competitive Cal grant. So if you can, please, please apply by March 2nd so that if you fall in those income and asset ranges, you could qualify for an entitlement, which is a lot easier than having to compete for a Cal grant. And just the word entitlement, I mean, that now you, you get this money, you're not competing with anybody, you're going to get it, you're entitled to it. Um, it's so important because education, and we, we said this earlier, it, it is expensive to get an education, but the truth is, it's more expensive not to have an education. You, you For most of these jobs, a good job, a, a, a livable wage job, you have to have a college education. Um, we, we have lots of programs at our community colleges and at, at our four-year universities that go beyond just a degree. Maybe it's a certificate that you want. Whatever it is you want to do, just be sure that you know that the doors are open. And if they're not, you've got to talk to people and ask the questions. Why aren't the doors open for me? What do I need to do? Uh, what other benefits are available to me? I will tell you also that um, our community colleges, and this is something that um, uh, the, the equity equity programs, equity plans for our community colleges uh, includes our foster youth, it includes our homeless youth, uh, in addition to uh, uh, recognized or um, specified minority groups as well. So wherever you're going to go to college, and Edwin, you talked about this, talk to the financial aid office ask them what's available to you um, and just sit in the corner. If there's a book that, of scholarships, sit in the corner and just start going through that list. Whatever it is you need to do because the money is there. Money is left on the table, just as Edwin said earlier. Um, here's another question. Um, and and the, the, this question has to do with uh, grad students. Uh, is there financial aid available for grad students? Yes, but it's not the same as what um, undergrad students get. So the undergrad students would be getting the Cal grants, the, uh, the Powell grants, whereas grad students, their financial aid awards are very much different. Um, it tends to be more loan based, depending on the program, depending on the institution. More often than not, the institution is going to be very, the, the financial aid package is going to be very institution centered. So you, you still should fill out the application because it's helpful for those institutions to have that information so that they can award you because they want to know what your need is. So they will award you based on that. However, it tends to be based on the institution. So that's why I don't want to give people the false of like, oh, you get a cow grade if you're a grad student. No, that's not how it works. But you should still fill out the application so that you can. So that they can calculate what your need is and can disperse money if necessary. And if you want to be sure not to get any money, you don't fill out the form. So the possibility of getting it, the only way that you, there's a possibility that you will get any, any financial aid is beginning the process, that is filling out the form. And again, going back to the, to the colleges and universities, you can again go to the financial aid office and ask them what's available. Um, uh, uh, here's another question. How, how would you tell FAFSA which school you were going to? Oh, um, so on the application, both the California Dream Act application and the, um, the FAFSA, the application for federal student aid, there is a thing called the college selection portion. So in the college selection portion, you can put up to 10 colleges. Now, this is a really important thing, and I hope everybody's listening very intently and very carefully because this is really important what I'm about to say. In order for us at the Student Aid Commission to actually begin the process to say whether you qualify for a Cal grant or not, we need you to list a California school in that initial list of 10. Uh, now, 
We prefer that you list a California Community College, we prefer a community college, a private school, and a UC and a CSU. The reason for that is we'll be able to tell you within a short amount of time, about a month or two, whether you qualify for a Cal grant and what that would look like at different institutions. So you want to make sure you put that in that initial list of 10. Now, if you don't put that in the initial list of 10, if you, especially if you're filling out the FAFSA, we won't get the, the federal government won't send us the application because they're like, okay, this person is not interested in California schools. Now, I know the first initial thought some of you may have is that, well, what if I have like 20 schools and California schools are sort of at the bottom and they're not really my main priority? Well, you got a simple answer for that. You can always put in the California schools in your first lecture list of 10, come back a week later, and then you can put in your new list of 10. And the, the application will still go to all these schools. They will know what order you put them in. Um, yeah, they'll just know that someone was thinking about them and someone would apply there. So pretty much there, please, 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 we cannot emphasize this enough. It's make sure you are putting California schools in your initial list of 10 so that we can process you for a Cal grant. Otherwise, we won't do it. The other way is you would have to fill out a conversion form or some sort of form that you can then submit to us for us to do that calculation for you. But that's a lot of paperwork. You don't want to go through that. The simplest way is make sure you list some California schools in your initial list of 10. Edwin, I didn't know that. I just learned something new so that when the students are asking me, now I will always tell them to include a California school. Of course, I expect them to put a California school, but I had never thought to tell them that they need to include at least one uh, California school. Um, uh, here's another question. It says, I have already applied for FAFSA. Uh, so how and where can I check if I qualified for Cal Grant? Perfect. Um, so there's, we have this thing called web grants for students. And what it pretty much does is that it allows the student to check where the application is. So web grants for students is a really great, uh, phenomenal thing. You can, it tells you if you're actually missing things. Uh, if you're missing a certain thing, if you didn't finish your application, if you're missing certain information, it tells you all of that information. So we actually recommend that you check out web grants for students. It's really great resource. Yeah, it's super helpful. Wonderful. And then you can always find it on our website. So just go on our website, type in web grants for students, and you just log in and you create your account and you'll be able to see all that information. Very good. Uh, here's another question. When given a financial aid package, uh, how would I be able to collect it via the FAFSA? So the financial aid package will be coming from your school. And so what will happen is the school will receive a financial aid package and the school will receive your application and then they will send you your award package. Once they send you the award package, you can then pretty much pick, okay, which award package do I like from the school? And then the communication is between you and the school now. So it won't be coming from the federal government, going to the federal government to the school and you receive it through the school. Very good. And I see that my, and my, my team has, if you look in the chat box, my team has been putting in the, the links. Um, again, you can always call us or whatever, whatever you need. Please know that we are available to you. And here's our last question. Are sports scholarships a different topic? Yes and no, um, because we still need you to fill out an application. This institution needs you to fill out an application so they can know what your need is and can award you those scholarships. So that's where it's not a different topic. But where it is a different topic is that we're not the ones dispersing that. That's not, you know, federal aid. That's not state aid. That's between you and the institution. It may have come from the federal government or from the state, but it's between you and the institution if they want to award you a sports scholarship. Uh, but we still want you to fill out that application so that the institution can calculate what you need. Wonderful. Edwin, thank you so much. You have been so helpful. My community deserves to get all this information and I thank you for providing it. Any final words? Yeah, no, first of all, thank you so much, Assembly Member. I appreciate you having me here and being able to talk about financial aid. I cannot stress enough how important the March 2nd deadline is. Uh, please, please, please. And also, if you have any questions, if you need any direct assistance to the application, we have our final statewide cash for college webinar happening this Thursday, 5.30 to 8 p.m. And I know Ismar just put information in the chat, so reach out to her. I'll send her all that information. And we also have local webinars going on pretty much up until September. 
So continue to look out for these things. If you need help, we are here for you. Your some members here for you and please watch your application on time. Oh, thank you so much, Edwin. I, I, I want to thank all of our guests also and those who are in education, those who are providing scholarship information, those who are receiving the scholarship information. Uh, we know that these are uncertain times that we're living in. And I wanted to know that as your representative, I, I want to do everything that I can to, to help you in whatever your dreams are, whatever your goals are. I want you to know that we're in this together. I want you to know that whatever information we provide to you, we will provide that to you. But we believe that the best way to, to help you with your success is providing useful information for you and for your family, listening to your concerns as well and helping you to solve whatever, wherever we can. I, I want to thank all of you who provided the questions beforehand and those of you who provide the questions here in the chat box. Uh, we have uh, another town hall coming up on COVID. I hope you'll join us for that. Please sign up with, with our, at our website so that we can provide you information as it becomes available. Again, Edwin, I want to thank you for, for providing such great information. I want to thank Cal State San Bernardino and lead Dr. Enrique Murillo for partnering with us on this. I want to thank the San Bernardino Community College District for, for being with us, um, Trustee Reyes, Angel Rodriguez, and Chancellor Jose uh, Torres. Also, um, Jesus Olguin from the Riverside School Board. Thank you all for being with us. And until next time, have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.